Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ballyhome Presbyterian Church. We give you a warm welcome wherever you're watching us from, and we pray that you'll know God's blessing as you share with us today. As ever, before we begin into the service, a few announcements. Today would be the first of our monthly United Evening services shared with our neighbouring churches here in Ballyhome. From now up until uh, the end of the year, we are going to continue to do that, but continue to do it online. So the first is this evening, and it's being hosted by our Methodist neighbours, and the link to that service, it will be in the pre-service shakedown email that you received uh, either last night or this morning. Secondly, we remind you that um, the collection for Storehouse continues, um, and what we're doing at the moment is you can bring your gifts to church on a Sunday if you're going to be coming in the next few weeks, or we will continue to uh, collect them between 10 and 11 a.m. on Monday morning outside the front doors of the church. That part will be reviewed at the end of the month to see how things are going and how things are uh, developing uh, within the community. But do remember the work of Storehouse. The church committee will meet on Zoom on Tuesday evening at half past seven, and would members please watch out for the link of that. Also, the Zoom prayer time is on Thursday evening at 8.10. We're not moving everything onto Zoom, but we have discovered that there are a few things that are working very well on Zoom, and one of them is the, the prayer time on Thursday evening. If ever there was a time for prayer in our lifetimes, it is now. This is a meeting for everyone. If you haven't prayed before and you're nervous about that, you can write out a long or a short prayer and, and just read it out um, during uh, the time that we spend together. Those who have joined us in it have really, really enjoyed uh, the prayer times and are finding it a real blessing and discovering a real peace through it. So watch out for the email. It, it is circulated um, in the middle of the week for you. Now, boys and girls, one of the things we noticed last Sunday was that uh, there weren't many boys and girls here in church. And we understand that at the moment because with no Sunday school and the likes, it makes it a bit difficult. But we do warmly welcome you. Uh, if you want to come, you're very, very welcome. We are aiming to get things moving, um, hopefully at the beginning of October. But don't despair, because remember the Rainbow Challenge back before the summer that we ran through a lot of the lockdown? Well, we did say there would be something for you on return from church. And we've been working very hard um, to get a rainbow box together for each family who participated in the challenge. And so uh, you maybe see some pictures at the minute. Uh, we're just giving you a few teasers. We're not letting you see what's inside them. But there is a box for each uh, family of the boys and girls who participated in the Rainbow Challenge. So uh, watch out. They are going to be here when you return back to church. And we will let you know of a particular Welcome Back to Church Sunday uh, that's brewing on the horizon. And then finally, it is with deep regret that I refer to the death during the past week of Dorothy White, of One Dorothy Avenue. Dorothy was an elder in our congregation. She was a former clerk of session. She is involved in many aspects of the life of the congregation and the behind the scenes organization. She has contributed an enormous amount to the life of Ballyhome Presbyterian um, over many, many decades. Among the things that she did, as I mentioned, was being elder and uh, clerk of session. A face, a familiar face, at virtually every service. She's going to be greatly missed by the church family as a whole, by her individual many uh, friends within the congregation, and I know outside the congregation as well, and also by those of us who have served as ministers, either as ministers or assistants, or um, deaconesses or whatever uh, over the years. Um, we want to extend our deepest sympathy and love and prayers to her husband, John, to Michael and Glynis, Gemma and Abby, and to Susan, John, Zoe and Beth. Let's just pause for a moment and then I'll pray. Lord, 
Even where I'm standing at the moment in the church building, I'm very close to the seat where Dorothy would have normally sat. And at the moment, it is hard to contemplate that we will not see her face there again. And her loss has brought a lot of upset and sadness and grief to many people, not least to her family. And we want to pray for them today, for John, for Michael, Glynis, Gemma and Abby, and for Susan and John, Zoe and Beth. Lord, we pray that you will be close to them, that you will comfort them and help them at this time of grief and loss, particularly a sudden loss. Sustain them, help them in every way that they require of you. Minister to their broken hearts and help them through these days. And what we pray for them, we also pray for, for Dorothy's close friends who also feel deeply her loss. We give you thanks for her place in our congregation and we honour all that she contributed to the life and ministry of this place over many, many years. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Seth is going to be preaching uh, for us today, and um, there is a challenge in, in what he is going to bring to us over the, the coming weeks. Here's two pictures that we find in the Bible, one uh, that is found in Romans, and it speaks of us. Not easy reading. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. There is no one who does good, not even one. Then this is what uh, the psalmist writes. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. So what happens when you bring those two together? When one bad family and one good God meet? And we're going to find out more about that in our service today. First of all, let's worship God together.
uh, let us join our hearts and our minds together as we pray. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to you. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, glorious Trinity. This morning, Lord, we lift our voices to honour and praise you. You, the Father who brought us into being, who loves and cares for us. To praise you, the Son who set aside the majesty of heaven to become our rescuer, enduring the shame and pain of the cross. To praise you, Holy Spirit, who enters and equips us for the life of faith, drawing us close to you each day. We celebrate your amazing acts set towards us and bringing us home to you once more. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide you, though the sinful human eye your glory may not see, you alone are holy. There's none beside you who is perfect in power, in love and purity. We're sorry for the mess we make of blessings that are good for us. Sorry for the way we talk to each other, treat each other, and act towards each other. Sorry for the things we think about that betray selfish, jealous, vengeful attitudes. How easily we find it to let ourselves slip from your ways. We lack stamina. We devour things that are not good for our souls. We make no effort to train ourselves, leaving us not capable for the race of life. One bad family, and yet you are one good God, and you have promised to forgive us if we confess that we now do. Forgive us, change us, help us to refocus upon him who is the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all your works shall praise your name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, glorious Trinity. How great are your riches, how deep is your wisdom and knowledge. We struggle to explain your decisions and understand your ways. For all things are created by you, and all things exist through you and for you. And you work to reconcile all things in heaven and on earth to yourself. So we give you the glory today for your grace and mercy towards us, and for the redemption found in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, boys and girls, it's time for your part in the service. And then once that is over, our reading today is going to be brought for us by Catherine Gill. God's story, Jacob wrestles. So part of God's story is about the time a guy named Jacob wrestled with a stranger. And it begins like this. Jacob grew up with a big, tough, hairy twin brother named Esau. Because Esau was the firstborn, he was supposed to get a special blessing. But Jacob was tricky. And with the help of his mom, wound up getting the blessing for himself. This made Esau furious, so Jacob ran away. A few years later, God told Jacob to return home, where Esau still lived. But Jacob was a little worried. He had heard that Esau was headed toward him with 400 men. Either Esau had a lot of friends, or he was bringing an army. So Jacob sent messengers ahead with gifts. Hopefully, if Esau was still angry with him, the gifts would calm him down. While Jacob was traveling, he stopped by a river. Now, God hadn't asked Jacob to stop. He stopped because he was afraid. He sent his family and servants and everything he owned across the river. Then he waited, alone, crying out to God in frustration. Jacob knew God had promised to be with him, but he was terrified. Suddenly, a man came into the camp out of nowhere and began to wrestle Jacob. Jacob fought back, and this was a knockdown, drag out title fight. All night, neither one of these fighters backed down. In fact, they wrestled for so long that the sun started to come up. When the stranger saw that Jacob wasn't gonna give up, 
He touched Jacob's hip, and that simple touch pulled Jacob's hip out of socket, causing him to limp. Then the man said, let me go. But Jacob knew there was something special about this guy. So he said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. The stranger stopped fighting and gave Jacob a new name. He said, your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel because you fought with God and with men and have won. See, the name Israel actually means God fights. Kids, that means that Jacob had been wrestling all night with God. Anyway, right after that, the stranger did bless Jacob. But the best part is, Jacob knew he had seen God face to face, and that changed him. Not only did Jacob get a new name, but he was no longer a fearful man running away from his own brother. In fact, when the stranger left, Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming. This time, he ran to Esau, kissed him, and gave him gifts just because he loved him. Jacob realized that he could obey God no matter how scared he felt. He could trust that God would always keep his promises. And that's the story of Jacob wrestling with God. So, in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God told Jacob to go home. That meant seeing his brother Esau. Jacob made camp near a river alone. He was terrified. A stranger came and wrestled him. They fought until dawn. The stranger touched Jacob's hip. The wrestling match was over. Jacob asked for a blessing. He got a new name first. It was Israel. The stranger was God. Jacob went to meet Esau. He trusted God. And that's a part of God's story. Genesis 39, verse 2 to 11. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favour in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had, with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was in sight. A long time ago, before there were scientists, there were alchemists. Alchemists had a big dream. They dreamed that they could turn worthless metals like lead into gold. So they studied ancient scrolls, they made long calculations, they melted metals, they poured in acids, and hoped to put just the right ingredients under just the right conditions, and then just maybe gold would pop out. Well, it turns out that alchemy was madness. It is physically impossible to turn lead into gold. The alchemists had big dreams, but they were never going to come true. In some ways, though, aren't we all alchemists? When I'm feeling cynical, it seems like my life is full of worthless lead. Things that are annoying, boring, pointless. Commuting, doing my tax forms, washing up the dishes, that kind of stuff. Heavy, dull as lead. And of course, we all know it gets worse, doesn't it? Many things aren't just heavy and dull. They're bad. They're evil. The health crisis. The environmental crisis. The things we suffer. The things that we do and regret. 
But of course we want to thrive. And so we try out a bit of alchemy. We, we try to find meaning in small things. We play video games, we watch Netflix. We tell ourselves how much we deserve. We construct our social media personas and we pour in a bit of faith, a bit of mindfulness and hope that if we put just the right ingredients under just the right conditions, then maybe at least some of our life will turn into a bit of gold. And the question comes, are our hopes of finding the good life as mad as the alchemist dreams of turning lead into gold? Are we mad to dream of better things? And a lot hangs on that question because if we're as misguided as the alchemists, then we are living in a grim story with a tragic ending. Because realistically, I can't manage the world. As much as I would like, I cannot create a vaccine or stop climate change or end poverty. You know, realistically, I can't even sort myself out. And the good news is, I don't have to. The good news is that God turns evil into good for his people. Over the next four weeks, we are looking at the story of Joseph, where God does some brilliant alchemy for his people. Joseph and his family are messed up. They are full of favoritism, jealousy, lies, and, well, we'll see what else. And lots of things go wrong for Joseph. Terrible things happen for him. All the while, he's facing a famine that is just as dangerous for his world as COVID is for ours. Joseph's story is full of bad stuff, worthless stuff. Can God convert all that lead into gold? Can God change the nastiness of Joseph's family? Can he transform Joseph's personal disasters into something beautiful? Can God turn an international health crisis into something good? Well, God starts with dreams. He gives Joseph dreams of a better future. So let's hear the story to see if the dreams that God sends come true. But first, we're going to hear the backstory. Joseph's story is just one episode in God's big story. So let's get caught up. God made the world good. He made people to represent him in the world, to be like him, to work with him, to receive his blessing. God's enemy, the devil, convinced people to revolt, to represent themselves in the world, to do things their way. And when that happened, God responded. He pronounced judgment, and the punishment fit the crime. People wanted to be separated from God, and now they were. But now they realize that separation from God means death, and that life apart from God is much harder than life with God. But God also pronounced mercy. He promised to send a rescuer, someone to destroy the devil and to make things right again. And time goes on. People make life unbearable, killing and enslaving each other. It's, it's awful. But not too much time passes before God takes the rescue project to its next stage. He chooses a man called Abraham and says, Abraham, one of your descendants will be the rescuer I promised. I'm going to bless you and everyone in the world through you. Now, Abraham wasn't always a great God, but God, great guy, but God worked with him. He never gave up on Abraham, and he never let Abraham give up on him. Abraham and his wife Sarah had a son called Isaac, and God transferred the promise to Isaac. One of Isaac's descendants would be this promised rescuer, and God was going to bless Isaac and bless everyone in the world through Isaac. Now, Isaac wasn't a great guy either, made some of the mistakes his father had made and made some new mistakes too. Those mistakes tore his family to bits. And that is important for our story because Isaac is Joseph's granddad. Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, had twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau was the eldest, the big, strong hunter. Isaac loved Esau. Jacob was not the big, strong hunter. He was clever conniving a grasper. Isaac 
didn't have much time for Jacob. But all Jacob wanted was his dad's love, his dad's blessing. So Jacob uses Esau's clothes to trick Isaac when he's old and blind into blessing him as the firstborn. And that made Esau so angry that he tried to kill Jacob. So Jacob flees for his life. God meets him and in a dream transfers the promise to him. Later, Joseph somehow, or Jacob somehow ends up with four wives and he only loves Rachel. Not really his fault, but that's another story. He also loves Rachel's boys more than any of their 10 brothers. Also, Jacob gets really cross at his oldest boy, Reuben, who totally deserves it, and at his second and third oldest boys, Levi and Simeon, who mostly deserve it, and none of those three boys are nice people. Jacob's family is meant to bless everyone, but here they are cursing one another to bits. That's problematic. It's always bad when God's people don't live up to their calling. How does God look when his chosen family don't even like each other? They're falling apart. And how is this promised descendant going to ever come from such a destructive family? This is a crucial moment in God's big story. Joseph's family needs a new beginning in a bad, bad way. But Joseph's story doesn't start well at all. Jacob plays favorites. Joseph wins, his brothers lose. And Joseph doesn't help himself. He's daddy's golden boy, he knows it. He's the second youngest, and he, the story opens as he gives daddy a bad report about his brothers. Now, knowing what sort of people they were, they probably deserved a bad report, but doing that sort of thing to 10 big angry brothers is never a good plan. Then daddy makes things worse with that famous robe. Jacob is saying to Joseph, you're the best. And to the brothers, well, you're not so great. Also, robes in those days are their uniform of royalty. So Jacob is hinting who's the little prince over the brothers. The brothers are furious. They won't even greet Joseph. They are treating him like a dead man. And God gets involved. God gets involved in the strangest way, and actually, it's a bit uncomfortable. Jacob singled Joseph out. So does God. Jacob gave Joseph a royal robe. God gave Jacob a royal dream. But Jacob is acting foolishly. He's hurting his sons like his father Isaac had hurt him while God is planning to heal the family. Remember, he's promised to bless Abraham's family. And remember, so far he has kept his promises, even sometimes when they seemed absolutely impossible. But sometimes from our perspective, God's strategy in our lives seems as weird as an alchemist's scribblings. Giving a cocky teenager like Joseph Two dreams that his whole family will bow down at his feet like he's the king is only ever going to have one result. Joseph trumpets his dream before his family so much that even Jacob gets cross at him. So the brothers take the flocks out to graze in the wilderness. Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers again. Maybe he's hoping silently that they'll, he'll give them another bad report. They see him coming. The murder that is in their hearts against him gets real. Some of them start to kill him. Reuben's the oldest. He rushes up. He rescues Joseph. He says, don't kill him. Just throw him in a pit and let something else kill him. You see, Reuben sees a chance to mend things with dad. He plans to sneak back, pull the boy out, take him home, Dad will be pleased. That's all he wants. So Reuben goes away. The rest of them have lunch. And with remarkable timing, some merchants come by. Judah has a brainwave. Why kill Joseph when you can just sell him? Listen to what he says. What will we gain? 
if we kill our brother. Come, let's sell him. After all, he is our brother. If that's how you treat a brother, I don't want to be part of that family. The merchants paid 20 pieces of silver. They hauled Joseph away. Reuben returns. He freaks out. Judah's plan worked. His didn't. Recurring feature. Now as the firstborn, he's got to face Jacob. So the brothers tear Joseph's robe. They cover it with the blood of a goat. They take it back to Joseph. We found this. Is this your son's robe? They can't bring themselves to say Joseph's name. And just like Isaac was deceived by his son's clothes, so was Jacob. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. I will mourn until I join my son in the grave. Meanwhile, off Joseph goes to Egypt as a slave, probably feeling safer with the slave drivers than he had felt with his brothers. No dad, no robe, not a lot of hope. If it weren't for those dreams, God had spoken to great grandpa Abraham and to grandpa Isaac and to father Jacob through dreams. The dreams God sent always came true. So as an Egyptian noble named Potiphar buys him, Joseph has something to cling to. Not much, because being a slave is wretched. But God doesn't give dreams and promises for nothing. Not even the dreams and promises he gives you. Even when things look awful, even when they are awful, you also have something to cling to. Some dream God has given you, the promises he's given you in scripture. You might not see how he'll keep those promises, but that doesn't mean he won't. So, what happens to Jacob and his family? Will God do his alchemy and turn the scrap metal of their lives into gold? If he does, how will we do it? What robes does Joseph have next? Well, you'll just have to listen to next week. To be continued. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this world, one which is full of beauty, the rhythms of nature, the richness of different cultures, and the miracle of life. Into this amazing creation you have placed us, bearing your image creating through the works of our hands and the imaginations of our minds. Give to everyone the potential of the wonderful adventure of life. How many children lie in their beds and dream of a future full of opportunities and experiences. It's wonderful that you also want a fullness of life to be discovered by all. But we know that sweet dreams can and do turn sour. And so today we pray for those who find themselves in such a place. For those soured by the actions of others. Because of anger, jealousy, greed, intolerance, narrow-mindedness, bullying and arrogance. Through the use of words insults, lies and hatred, by weapons designed to cause destruction of property, to break bodies and to penetrate into hearts and minds. How our world for all its education and freedom of thought is still marred down because of friction between people and how easily we can move from bemused detachment to ourselves becoming prickly and hurling insults. You called us to love you, love our neighbour and even love our enemy. Three requests, each of which we struggle to fulfil. Lord, help us to see that no improvement can come unless it begins in each one of us. So today we pray that all over the world people would be truly enlightened to self-awareness, and from there the embrace of a loving attitude, like that of Jesus Christ. We remember those whose dreams are soured by the consequences of the circumstances they live in, 
an abusive relationship, poverty, poor mental or physical health, war, natural disaster, the colour of their skin, the place of their birth, slavery and grief. So many influences which shape lives in a bad way that are beyond their control. But even in the fact that we pray, we declare you to be in control of everything. We ask for protection, aid, treatment, peace, equality and justice. For you are the one who binds up the brokenhearted, proclaims freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners who comforts all who mourn. So today we pray that you will change the circumstances of people all around the world, within our community, within our own homes. We remember those sarred by the self-inflicted wounds of bad choices that have led to hurt, separation and addiction full of selfish motives or driven by anger or yielding to peer pressure or trying to escape from the stresses and strains of life but now full of regret or further entrenched in bitterness. Those who may as well be living in a far off land. And so today we pray that like the prodigal son they would come to their senses and recognise their faults and find humility and return to a place of welcome and forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation. Ultimately, Lord, in all of this we need you, from whom we have wandered. And because we see the cracks appearing and the wheels coming off all around as dreams are soured. Yet your word says the laws, the laws of the Lord are true, and each one is fair. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They give us understanding and bring healing to our bones. So today, we pray for our longings, our hopes and dreams to find their fulfilment in you, who promised life in all its fullness. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
and the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.